Now, the Communist Manifesto needs no introduction. This is one of the most influential books ever written, really one of the most impactful political, philosophical, economic texts written in the last few hundred years. I think the real question is, why would I be talking about it on a podcast like this? Because you could make the argument that this book has led to the deaths of more people than almost any other book ever written. Uh, estimates put it at uh, as many as 100 million people died uh, directly and indirectly because of communism. But these ideas are still kind of popular. Some people will even advocate for these ideas. There's a whole class of kind of like neo-Marxist, modern communists. Some of the like anti-work uh, crowd online is still like a lot of these ideas. And if somebody was <laughs> going around online talking about how much they loved Mein Kampf and Nazism, you would rightfully think they were a terrible person. This book has like maybe been even worse. <laughs> I mean, it's it's sort of I mean it's really hard to quantify these things, right? Uh, but the the point is, right? Like these ideas have killed a ton of people, but people are still subscribing to that, right? It's there's really nothing else quite like this in the world right now. And so I think that you, you have kind of like two tracks you can take when you realize there are ideas that have done a lot of harm in the world that people are still subscribing to. Uh, one is you take the track that some people take today, which is to say those ideas should not be allowed to be discussed. Anybody who advocates for them should be taken off the Internet, right? We should uh, revoke their Twitter accounts. Uh, they shouldn't be allowed to talk because then talking is too dangerous. So we need to remove them from society. That's, you know, certainly been the popular thing to do the last few years. But I think that's a mistake. Uh, and it's a mistake because if you don't understand ideas that people are advocating for, if you simply try to uh, shut them off, then you never learn how to debate and discuss those ideas. Uh, and also, when you say that uh, a certain set of ideas is not allowed to be discussed, then the people who do want to discuss and explore them end up retreating into their own, or retreating into obscurity, retreating into their own areas to talk about those ideas. And then those ideas can kind of just like fester on themselves and grow and get worse and worse because uh, they're not being debated in a public forum. So uh, banning ideas is, I think, pretty much always a mistake. What, what you should really do is try to understand them. And so that's why I thought it might be interesting to read the Communist Manifesto, because uh, off the bat, I know that these ideas have been pretty terrible for society. I don't think you can really argue with that. Uh, but you do have people obviously saying like, well, it just hasn't been done right yet. Like it's it's a great plan. It's a great theory. We just, we just haven't quite figured it out. And so I, I think that's another question we have to ask too, is like, okay, well, maybe there are good ideas in here and they just haven't been done yet, right? Like, we're going to find out. So thank you for joining me on this journey and let's dive in. Now, let's start with part of how they define uh, the benefits of kind of part of what they're trying to, to bring about. And I should mention that the Communist Manifesto was actually written by both Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. It was written kind of as a collaboration. And one of the cool things I learned in the introduction was that they basically banged this out in like three weeks. <laughs> Engels had a lot of existing writing. Marx had done uh, some amount of writing and, and speaking and discussing topics. So they, they knew the ideas pretty well. Uh, and they didn't invent communism with this book. It was already kind of like gaining some ideas. And they were the ones who really codified it. But again, they, they wrote it in about three weeks. And if you're watching the YouTube video, the actual manifesto is only about 100 pages of this 350 page print. Most of this is the introduction. One of the things the, the introduction talks about is that today we often think of communism, the idea of, uh, you know, everything being shared and owned by everyone, uh, no private property, uh, government taking over a lot of the means of production, a lot of those ideas as inherently restrictive, right? Like you would have a lot less freedom if you weren't able to own things, but they're, they're actually arguing the opposite. They're saying that communism should above all enable the free self-development of individuals. Equality should mean equal opportunity, not equal consumption or equal enjoyment. Communism and individual self-realization must go together. So a so part of what they're arguing here is that people are unfree because of the existing structure in which fewer rich capital owners control everything, and then most people are resigned to wage labor. And you would actually be much freer as an individual if you kind of broke down that structure. Uh, and we're going to get to kind of like what those details mean later. So th that's kind of the first thing to keep in mind, is that part of the argument here 
right? And part of why it ends on working men of all countries unite, right? And there's different translations, I'm sure. It's kind of ending there is it's saying that you are unfree because of this structure. And the way you can actually be self-actualized as an individual is if we undo it. And so it really is this battle cry that the, the only way you will be free is if we break down the current economic world that we live in. So right off the bat, they lay out what they're trying to undo. He says the history, or they say the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight. A fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstruction of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. I think it's really interesting and important that this is the first paragraph, is that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. So they're doing something pretty bold here <laughs> because they're saying off the bat that the story of civilization is class struggles. These struggles have always existed. There have always been fewer people in power, and then the, the masses under them, right? Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian. This is the, the dichotomy of civilization. And the, the, the implication with that is that we have a solution. We have a way out. This, this is how we fix that. This is how we uh, undo this history of civilization. And so they go on and say that society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps into two great classes directly facing each other, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And they say in here too that this was kind of a natural evolution from the, the, the old feudal societies. For the modern bourgeois class that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with class antagonisms. It has but established new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle in place of the old ones. Again, these class struggles have always existed. And now the new one is the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. And this new rich, powerful class has created new means of oppressing. And they're, they don't like explicitly say enslaving, but it is kind of like the implication here, right? Like entrapping in, in the proletariat. So where does that class divide come? This is, I think, one of the very interesting points that they're going to explain, which is that this class divide and the magnification of the class divide is a result of industrialization. And this is why I think we see some of the remnants and continuation of these ideas today, because this, this divide has only gotten larger and larger and larger, because technology does allow one person to do the work that might have required 10 or 100 people in the past, right? Obviously, I'm making this podcast and I have a wonderful editing team that helps out with me or that helps <laughs> me out. Um, but beyond that, I, I'm able to like distribute it right pretty freely using the internet and using all these incredible tools. I can film it automatically with my camera and my microphone system, right? There's a lot of ways that tools have replaced individual labor that might have been needed in the past. So they say, modern industry has converted the little workshop of the patriarchal master into the great factory of the industrial capitalist. Masses of laborers crowded into the factory are organized like soldiers. As privates of the industrial army, they are placed under the command of a perfect hierarchy of officers and sergeants. Not only are they slaves of the bourgeois class and of the bourgeois state, they are daily and hourly enslaved by the machine, by the overlooker, and above all, by the individual bourgeois manufacturer himself. This is really, I think, the most one of the most important pieces of the groundwork they're laying. These divides have always existed, and this new rise of industry is making them worse. Because where you used to have a blacksmith, right, in your town who would do all the smithing and you might have an apprentice or two. And but that would be he'd be really limited by what he and his one or two apprentices could do in a day. His, his wealth was cat and he could only uh, use the labor of so many people. There was a little bit more of a surplus to go around. And on top of that, each town could have a blacksmith. It's not like one blacksmith could serve every single town in the country. But that world is gone because now that we have industrialization and machines, one blacksmith can kind of serve the entire country. Like one master blacksmith, one expert, one top producer can replace what might have been what might have required 100 top producers spread around the country. 
And this is a really important point, and it is the true point, which is that industrialization, machines have made it possible for one person's wealth and the spread of their efforts to multiply in a way that has never been possible before. The reason we see so much incredible wealth today in you know the hands of a small number of people is because of technology. Really, the only way that ever happened in the past was uh, if you were king of an incredibly widespread country and you had some huge reserves of gold. And so that, that was obviously limited to very few people. <laughs> uh, and, and now it's a lot of business people, in most cases, and financiers, because again, the work of one person can be multiplied so much by both technology and wage labor. And this is really why I think these ideas hold so much weight today, because we still see this divide. We see it even more now than Marx and Engels did. And it's, I think, quite natural to feel a certain degree of dissatisfaction when you're on the wage labor side of it. There's this sense of why does the CEO, the founder, whatever of this business have 100x the salary that I do. And when you're faced with that dichotomy, you kind of have a couple of ways to react to it, right? One is, you know, acceptance, right? And <laughs> say, okay, well, whatever, that's just the way it is. Uh, I'm going to go back to work. There's a yearning dissatisfaction that you could have, which is like, okay, well, this clearly isn't right for me. So I'm going to try to be that person. I'm going to try to become a CEO, become a financier, become a founder. I'm going to get out of this current wage situation I'm in and try to achieve that. Or there is the destructive reaction, which is what Marx and Engels are advocating for. It's this system is broken and unfair, and the only way out of it is to destroy it. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just want to take a moment to tell you about Readwise. If you haven't used Readwise, it is the absolute best app for anybody who loves reading. I use it to read all of the articles online. I think it has the best-in-class article reader. Uh, I also use it to save my highlights and notes from everything that I read. So if you're reading something on Kindle or iBooks, it will just automatically pull out any highlights that you take and save them for you and send them to any note-taking tool that you use. And if you read physical books like I do, uh, I'll just mark with little sticky tabs as I go. And then I can use my phone to take pictures of the page and automatically scan in the highlights. It is so, so helpful for getting the most out of every single book I read, making sure that I can find uh, any quotations or ideas are really loved in the future. If you're a serious reader, you absolutely need this tool. You can go to readwise.io slash nat to get a two-month free trial. It's a month longer than they normally do, and it's a great way to help support the show. So again, just go to readwise.io slash nat and check it out if you haven't already, and let's get back to the episode. But they do something really interesting. They don't go straight to saying, you're trapped, you're slaves, you need to just destroy this system because otherwise your lives will never be better. Right? It's not exactly a take up arms and attack your boss call to action. Instead, they say it's going to happen anyway. You almost don't have to do anything. The essential condition for the existence and for the sway of the bourgeois class is the formation and augmentation of capital. The condition for capital is wage labor. Wage labor rests exclusively on competition between the laborers. The advance of industry, whose involuntary promoter is the bourgeoisie, replaces the isolation of the laborers due to competition by their revolutionary combination due to association. The development of modern industry, therefore, cuts from under its feet the very foundation on which the bourgeoisie produces and appropriates products. What the bourgeoisie, therefore, produces above all is its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. So they say a lot in that paragraph, but they're basically laying out why they think that this system is destined to fail. And the, the argument is kind of compelling, right? It, I, it's very easy to read this, especially if you were reading this when it came out and you didn't have the benefit of history. You could read this and say, oh, this makes perfect sense. Because let, let, me, let me just walk through the argument again in case it wasn't really clear, right? The essential conditions for the existence of this class divide is a small number of rich people and a mass of wage laborers. And this divide is getting bigger and bigger. And the only way it gets bigger and bigger is if the bourgeoisie enlist more, more and more wage laborers under them, right? And so this is the, one of the first important parts of this argument. The only way that you get 10x richer is if you have 10x more employees working under you. Now, we know that's not really true anymore, but to a certain extent, it was true at the time because of 
uh, just the limits of machination. The greater the divide gets, the more wage laborers are supporting fewer bourgeoisie people. But the advance of industry replaces the isolation of the laborers due to competition by their revolutionary combination due to association. So uh, let's go back to like the blacksmith example, right? You have different blacksmiths living in different towns. It's hard to compete with each other because they're spread apart. They're not really, their apprentices probably aren't talking very much. <laughs> they're not uh, comparing salaries or, you know, pieces of silver they're getting because they're, they're spread out. And uh, there's this natural competition uh, amongst the, the different blacksmiths in the different cities, whatnot. When you combine all of them into one business, you now suddenly have this one owner and then you have all of the apprentices right under them. And all of them are talking because they're all in the same factory, standing next to each other, doing the same work over and over. And so by combining all of the wage laborers together, you end up with this revolutionary combination, as Marx and Engels put it you necessarily create a situation in which they will all realize that this is unfair and they will rise up against their boss or the, the owner of the business. And so that's why they say that the development of modern industry produces their own grave diggers because the bigger a company gets, the bigger, uh, the, the richer the bourgeoisie get, the more they are combining wage laborers together into shared situations in which they will eventually start talking and say, hey, we don't like this. We want a better situation. So that's why they say that its fall and the victory of the proletariat are inevitable because it will eventually hit a breaking point where there are too many wage laborers who are dissatisfied with the situation of things and they're all working together and they're all necessary for continuing to produce products that they will rise up, fight back and demand a better life. Again, this is a pretty compelling argument. It makes sense, right? When you read it, it's like, oh yeah, okay, that that is clearly, like something like that could clearly happen, right? Again, reading this in late 1800s, uh, so you, you kind of see, okay, yeah, they're, they're, they're laying out a good argument here. And again, you can see why it would be popular today, right? To a certain extent, uh, this is part of the argument for unions, right? If everybody works together, we can uh, demand better terms for our work. And so you, you can see, again, continuing why this is compelling today. Now, granted, the last part is the question. The fall of the bourgeois production machine and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. That's where we start to be able to ask some questions, right? Like, why does it have to fall? <laughs> right, that, that might be the first question because Marx and Engels are laying out this very strong dichotomy, right? It's either going to keep growing forever or it, there's going to be a revolution and it's all going to break down. You could also just make the argument that it will hit a point of homeostasis. There will be a point where the mass of wage laborers say, okay, like we, we've we negotiated enough uh, to feel good. We have 401ks and healthcare and above minimum wage incomes. And like that, that's a good balancing point. It doesn't have to be that everybody takes up arms and destroys Amazon, right? Like there, there are a lot of other solutions in the gray between the, these black and white outcomes. They say the theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. That's, in, I mean, I was really interested in that when I read it because everything that I'd read up to this point and that I talked about uh, on this podcast up to this point, they didn't really say that. <laughs> they laid out all these arguments that uh, the, you know, the snake is going to eat its tail of industry growth. The, the bourgeoisie will eventually destroy themselves from excessive greed. And they, they kind of, I thought that was sort of like the central argument, but no, it's, this abolition of private property. It's a hard-won, self-acquired, self-earned property. Do you mean the property of the petty artisan and of the small peasant, a form of property that preceded the bourgeois form? There is no need to abolish that. The development of industry has to a great extent already destroyed it and is still destroying it daily. Or do you mean modern bourgeois private property? But does wage labor create any property for the laborer? Not a bit. It creates capital. That kind of property which exploits wage labor, which cannot increase except upon condition of getting a new supply of wage labor for fresh exploitation. Property in its present form is based on the antagonism of capital and wage labor. Let us examine both sides of this antagonism. So they're making an important distinction here. They don't mean property like this couch, right? Or like this book. They, they more seem to mean like land and capital and businesses and all of the things that contribute to wealth, right? The, the things that have value uh, assets that have the potential to produce income. Because they, they say that the 
the property of the petty artisan of the small peasant, like that property is gone already, which is interesting. And you could maybe imagine them talking about people living in factory towns, right? So if you live in a factory town, your your house is like owned by the company that you work for. You might get a lot of your groceries from them too. And in a sense, it really does kind of blur the lines between slavery and wage labor, because if if your whole life is being paid for by the company directly, right, not just indirectly because you're, you're taking your salary and paying for these things, then you, you're you kind of owned by the company and you don't have this uh, traditional form of property. You don't have your house and your like coffee mug and those things. They've all been absorbed by the, the bourgeoisie. So I believe that that's what he's getting at here. The abolition of private property means the abolition of capital. It means just taking away the ways that this rich class is getting richer and richer and richer. And we get to this later, but that then means giving it to the state, giving it back to the people, right? Allowing people to own the fruits of their labor again. And this is, again, where you can see how this could be very compelling today, because a lot of people have a sense that they don't produce anything meaningful, that they're, they have a bullshit job, so to speak. They uh, muck around in spreadsheets or make decks. Maybe they're working in a warehouse or they're working at a cash register. There, there is a sense for a lot of people that they no longer, there's a sense for a lot of people that they work quite hard all day and they don't see any benefit in the world because of it. They, they get their, they get their wage, sure, but they are not owning the fruits of their labor the way a carpenter might. They don't get to like make things. And so there's, there's an appeal here that we should go back to, or we should reachieve a society where you do get I, some benefit of the things that you make, right? And the only way to achieve that is if you have a partial ownership in the means of production. But that's not possible, according to Marx and Engels, as long as we have this world of wage labor. They say the average price of wage labor is the minimum wage, that quantum of the means of subsistence, which is absolutely requisite to keep the laborer in bare existence as a laborer. What, therefore, the wage laborer appropriates by means of his labor merely suffices to prolong and reproduce a bare existence. In bourgeois society, living labor is but a means to increase accumulated labor. In communist society, accumulated labor is but a means to widen, to enrich, to promote the existence of the laborer. Okay, so really important distinction here, right? They're saying that wage labor is the bare minimum that a company can pay you so that you can not die, <laughs> right? That, that the reason that uh, wage laborers, the proletariat don't own anything, they don't have any capital, is that they're only being paid enough to stay alive. And to a certain extent, that's true, right? The, the minimum wage that people will typically accept is the minimum amount that they feel they can get by on. And often if you're earning a minimum wage, if you're just earning enough to get by, then yes, you are not accumulating capital the way that the owner of your business might be. And then they say something interesting where we start to get into what I'm talking about later as kind of the like salvation or heaven myth uh, accompanying communism. They say, in bourgeois society, living labor is but a means to increase accumulated labor, right? In communist society, accumulated labor is but a means to widen, to enrich, to promote the existence of the laborer. How? <laughs> right? Because that's a big claim, right? That's a really big claim that uh, we're going to take away all this private property, take away all this capital, we're going to give it back to the people and to the state, and then everything that you do will enrich you instead of enriching someone else. Right. And the, the answer is somewhat embedded in the description I just gave. It's this idea that, well, if you own a part of the business instead of this one person owning all of it, then you are owning in some of the upside. You're getting some of the benefits. And that, again, kind of like makes sense intuitively because this is where it starts to get very utopian. Right. They go on to say the abolition of this state of things is called by the bourgeois abolition of individuality and freedom. And rightly so, the abolition of bourgeois individuality, bourgeois independence, and bourgeois freedom is undoubtedly aimed at. And by freedom is meant, under the present bourgeois conditions of production, free trade, free selling, and buying. We're not just undoing this power structure. We're not just taking away the capital means of production and redistributing it. We're also getting rid of buying and selling. This talk about free selling and buying and all other brave words of our bourgeoisie about freedom in general have a meaning, if any, only in contrast with restricted selling and buying with the fettered traders of the Middle Ages, but have no meaning when opposed to the communistic abolition of buying and selling of the bourgeois condition of production and of the bourgeoisie itself. And they say that that's 
only scary if the type of people you're trying to prevent or to protect are the bourgeoisie. From the moment when labor can no longer be converted into capital, money, or rent into a social power capable of being monopolized, i.e. from the moment when individual property can no longer be transformed into bourgeois property, into capital, from that moment you say individuality vanishes. You must therefore confess that by individual you mean no other person than the bourgeois, than the middle class owner of property. This person must indeed be swept out of the way and made impossible. Communism deprives no man of the power to appropriate the products of society. All that it does is to deprive him of the power to subjugate the labor of others by means of such appropriation. And I think you could read this part in a couple of ways, because on the one hand, it does really feel like they're saying that everybody's going to own everything and <laughs> there's going to be a free sharing amongst us. We don't need money. We don't need trade because we're all just going to be united running all these companies together. And that's where it starts to feel like, okay, this is really, this has gone from a somewhat compelling statement about the way society is structured today to this incredibly idealistic imagination of where society could go tomorrow. And yeah, that sounds great, but it's very hard to argue that just having the right philosophy will bring about some incredible utopian state that is contrary to human nature and how humans have existed for as much of recorded history as we have access to. And one of the big challenges people make is they say that, uh, well, if if you can't earn anything, if you can't like get rich for working hard, then people will just become lazy. There'll be no motivation to work hard anymore. And they address that. They say it has been objected that upon the abolition of private property, all work will cease and universal laziness will overtake us. And then they, they make out an interesting point. They say, according to this, bourgeois society ought long ago to have gone to the dogs through sheer idleness. For those of its members who work acquire nothing, and those who acquire anything do not work. The whole of this objection is but another expression of the tautology, that there can no longer be any wage labor when there is no longer any capital. And, and this is where I think we get into one of the like big problems of this ideology, which is this idea that once people get rich, they stop working. That used to be somewhat true. We used to kind of have a leisure class, uh, but people in general worked less, right? Even if you were a subsistence farmer, the estimates are something like you would only work about 200 days a year, right? It's a lot less than how often we work now. And there were periods of time where people would get rich and then they would just stop working. They would retire and you know, they'd be the leisure class, right? They'd just be socialites. That doesn't happen that much anymore. And actually, if you look at statistics on how much people work, often the there, there's a a peak at the very low end of income, right? People who are working two or three jobs just to stay afloat. And then it goes way down through the middle. And the people who work the most, again, are the people who are earning the most money. Um, often the richest people are the ones who are working basically from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep. So this idea that those who acquire anything do not work it's simply not true, right? The people who acquire anything often end up working harder. And that's why there's kind of this uh, funny thing with the anti-work community on Reddit today, which is they have this banner that says like unemployment for all, not just the rich. The rich are super employed usually. <laughs> They're usually working like way harder uh, than people who are sitting on Reddit all day. And so this is one one area where where some of this starts to break down because we're as we get to the end here, we we get like the final real clarification of all the ideas, right? So they say, nevertheless, in the most advanced countries, the following will be pretty generally applicable. Abolition of property in land and application of all rents to land in public purposes, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax, abolition of all right of inheritance, confiscation of the property of all emigrants and rebels, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly, centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state, extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, the bringing into cultivation of wastelands, the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan, equal liability of all labor, establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country by a more equable distribution of the population over the country, free education for all children in public schools, abolition of children's factory labor in its present form, combination of education with industrial production, etc., etc. And And this is where I think we can see why this is not simply a, it just hasn't been done right yet, 
uh, situation, why this philosophy basically just like doesn't, I think, really work. It's a wonderful utopian idea, right? It's a great heaven myth. You could imagine this world existing, and maybe it would in like a bad sci-fi novel or something. But there are just clear ways that it conflicts with natural, with like human nature, with natural motivation. So abolition of all right of inheritance, right? I mean, this is one that obviously you don't want wealth to compound too dramatically over generations, but people naturally want to be able to support their children <laughs> in their adult life. And the idea that uh, when you die, it should all go to the state instead of going to your children is naturally going to ruffle uh, some people's feathers, right? Extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state. And so this idea that uh, the, the state is going to own, again, all the means of production is you can give uh, them some credit for this idea at the time, but it is something that has just really not worked. And there's a lot of difference between how governments operate and how companies operate. And one of the most important being that companies need to be allowed to die in order for the successful, well-run ones to kind of like rise to the surface. And one of the big problems with just centralizing everything in the state in these like massive conglomerate corporations run by the government is that they don't have those same pressures to survive and they end up becoming kind of like bloated, inefficient, uh, decrepit institutions or like a lot of our government agencies are. There's this idea of abolition of the distinction between town and country and just equally distributing people across the country. So uh, getting rid of cities, not uh, do you force people to leave a town when it gets too big, right? There's a lot of questions there. And this is where you start to see that there, there's a conflict here between they're saying that we will have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. Well, it's not the, <laughs> because you're not allowed to have too many people in one place because you want to equally distribute everyone around the country. You're not having free development because somebody can't uh, build a business for some like new invention, new product that they want to bring to market. You're not having free development because you can't support your children in the future because of limits to inheritance, right? It It is both very, or it's, it's actually much more totalitarian than it is a, a free development because it requires so much control and so much restriction in order to supposedly lead to like freedom. To be fair, there are ways that restriction can be freeing Right? Sometimes limiting your options actually makes you quite a bit happier. You can have this paradox of choice effect. You can be overwhelmed with the amount of like options and freedom at your disposal. But if you're telling people you can't give anything to your kids, you can't start a business, uh, you can't earn more than this amount, too many of you can't live in a town, that is not really the free development. That is, again, like a very totalitarian state, which is why communist states tended to be not particularly free for the individuals. It's interesting to see how this book progresses because it, it does a really good job of laying out those problems at the beginning, but then doesn't do a very good job of explaining how we get there and why it's inevitable that we get there. You, you have this sense in the beginning that, oh, they're going to lay out this very, very compelling argument and vision for how we go from current society to this wonderful common society. And it doesn't quite stick the landing. And Marx apparently spent the last 15 years of his life working on his book, Capital. He was studying ancient indigenous societies, trying to understand how they lived more communally. And he never quite figured it out. And so I don't think we should be that surprised that it didn't work and that it hasn't worked and that it won't magically work in the future. It's just a flawed ideology. But it does very it does do a very good job explaining what some of the problems are today. It just doesn't do a great job of providing the solutions to them. So all that said, I did enjoy reading it. I, I thought it was very interesting to see these arguments, to try to look at them with a critical eye, to think about you know, how they might be compelling and enticing uh, and where they might fall flat. And to be honest, reading it, it is a very compelling idea. Right? It's a wonderful utopian ideology, but utopias don't work. <laughs> right? Like if they did, we would probably be in one right now. But I, I think Schopenhauer in his essays and aphorisms earlier episode, you know, he, he said that every utopia that we can think of would fail because we uh, we just don't do well in like perfect situations. We would just get bored and start attacking each other and finding new ways to compete with each other because that's kind of our nature. And it's maybe sad to think about, but I also think it's kind of true. We have so much of that competition and that desire for resources hardwired into us just naturally from evolution, right? Something uh, Becker talked about in Denial of Death too, that 
We can't deny that. We can't pretend that we can just magically like wash it away with a good ideology because it's just not going to happen. What we need to do is we need to figure out how to live with each other, how to be happy, uh, fulfilled individuals while recognizing the power of those motivations. So obviously pick it up if you want to. If you're enjoying this podcast, please leave me a review on Spotify, iTunes, like and subscribe on YouTube, do all of those things. They really, really help get the show out there more. And I'm really enjoying doing it. I'd like to keep doing it. Uh, and I've been hearing wonderful things from all of you too. So thank you for listening. Send it to a friend if you haven't already. That's the other really great thing you can do to help. And I will see you next time.